Live from New York City, it's the Gary Knoll Show. And now, your host, Gary Knoll. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Knoll. Nice to have you with us today, a special edition. We're going to talk about our national, state, local surveillance. We are living now in a fascist country. Fascism is defined by corporate and governmental interests working together for their mutual benefit, but at the exclusion of the rights and proclivities of the average American. Joining me today will be Jesse Ventura for the entire hour. We have as our guest a man who has been in politics. He voices strong issues involving our freedoms. He is certainly a leading member of the progressive community. He was a Navy SEAL during the latter phase of the Vietnam War, followed by a career in the World Wrestling Federation and then a national sportscaster. And then in the early 1990s, Jesse began his political career, first as mayor of Brooklyn Park in Minnesota and later being elected as the governor of the state on the independent reform ticket from 1998 to 2002. Jesse has been an ardent supporter of Main Street Americans. When his state of Minnesota ran a budget surplus, he provided a sales tax rebate since the money belonged to the public. He's been a proponent of gay and women's rights, opposition to trade sanctions, and a leading critic of federal policies leading America into morphing into a police surveillance state. He's written several books, including 63 documents the government doesn't want you to read. His most recent publication, released this month, is Demo Crips versus Rebloodicans, No More Gangs in Government, by Skyhorse Publishing. Nice to have you with us today, Jesse. Hi, Gary. Uh, let me state this. A lot of people have trouble sounding out Rebloodicans. You just got to sound it out by Rebloodicans. <laughs> Go ahead. But many people, that's a tongue twister. But uh, I think the key title to the book is the subtitle, No More Gangs in Government. We appreciate that. What we're going to do today, we're going to do the entire hour, but we're going to intersperse it with some leading articles by some major thinkers who are not respected or accepted into the mainstream dialogue, yet are clearly ahead of the curve and have truth on their side to show you how much of the story that's out there now everyone has missed, including the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, the networks, Bill O'Reilly. They've all missed the big story. You haven't. In fact, with your television series and the statements you've made, historically, you have been right on these issues. So we're going to intersperse those. Plus, we're going to begin by sharing two different Obamas. This is candidate Obama versus President Obama. Listen to what he says as the candidate. Listen to what he says as the president. We'll have this for you in just a second. Our, our engineer is getting this up. The separation of powers works. Our Constitution works. We will again set an example for the world that the law is not subject to the whims of stubborn rulers and that justice is not arbitrary. This administration acts like violating civil liberties is the way to enhance our security. It is not. There are no shortcuts to protecting America. But my assessment and my team's assessment uh, was that they help us prevent terrorist attacks. This administration also puts forward a false choice between the liberties we cherish and the security we provide. You can't have 100 percent security and also then have 100 percent privacy and zero inconvenience. Uh, you know, they, they, we're, we're going to have to make some choices uh, as a society. I will provide our intelligence and law enforcement agencies with the tools they need to track and take out the terrorists without undermining our Constitution and our freedom. That means no more illegal wiretapping of American citizens. 
No more national security letters to spy on citizens who are not suspected of a crime. No more tracking citizens who do nothing more than protest a misguided war. No more ignoring the law when it is inconvenient. That is not who we are. And it's not what is necessary to defeat the terrorists. And uh, what I can say is, is that in evaluating these programs, they make a difference in our capacity to anticipate and prevent possible terrorist activity. In the abstract, you can complain about Big Brother and how this is uh, uh, a potential, uh, you know, you know, program run amok. But when you actually look at the details, then I think we've struck the right balance. Have we? Jesse, let's open by having you give us your view of the current uh, disclosures by a whistleblower who came forward, Edward Snowden, and spoke with Glenn Greenwald about what he knew and what he was observing and how he is being attacked by many journalists, and they want him indicted, they want him arrested. And I have to ask, what crime did he commit, and what crimes did he expose? And why are they not going after the people who committed the crimes that he exposed instead of him? The form is yours. Take your time. Well, absolutely, Gary. That That's the problem in our society today is that we want to kill the messenger and not the message. And and uh, it's ridiculous. Um, the thing that troubles me the most about President Obama is, is the fact that they uh, – they tell us that they, they, they're required to make us safe. Well, by putting us all under surveillance, like, and I know Senator Lindsey Graham made the same statement, we need this to fight terrorism. Well, what they're then saying to me is simply, you might be a terrorist, so we have to watch you. So, in essence, they're calling every citizen of the United States a potential terrorist that we all could snap or something at some point and and do detrimental things to American society and our government. I, I find it ironic that we're supposed to be the boss because we pay the money. They're using our money to watch us. I mean, I find that if you look at this thing, that's the employee putting the employer under surveillance. <laughs> That's astonishing. And I think we as a society need to take the reins of our country back and let government know that they're there to work for us, that it's not vice versa. And, uh, yeah, and, and I'm offended that my president and Senator Graham would insinuate that in some way I'm a potential terrorist which is what they're saying by uh, violating the Fourth Amendment. And, you know, people need to understand the Constitution and the Bill of Rights are not outdated. When our forefathers created, created this great country, it was an experiment. It was a country different from any other country in the world, and that's because of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And if we allow the Bill of Rights and Constitution to be destroyed, well, then the United States experiment is over, and we thus become no different than any other country in the world. And maybe that's, if, if I could be so bold and say maybe that's what the powers to be have in mind, if they're looking at a globalized one government, well, then they certainly can't have the United States and its Bill of Rights and Constitution intact. I appreciate that opening statement. You're familiar with the Daniel Ellsberg of the Pentagon Papers, correct? Yes, yeah, somewhat. I mean, as well as I can be. That happened when I was very, very young, and I wasn't as much in tune, shall we say. I, I was more interested then in listening to Jimi Hendrix. Okay, well, <laughs> and, and, and as we all were. But as you said, the Constitution is not outdated. Daniel Ellsberg's initial turning over the Pentagon Papers today is not outdated either. The philosophy of turning over a crime that you've seen being committed against the people is essential. Here's what he says, as reported in The Guardian. It is my estimation there has not been in American history a more important leak than Edward Snowden's release of the National Security um, Association's material. 
and that definitely includes the Pentagon Papers 40 years ago. Snowden's whistleblowing gives us the possibility to roll back a key part of what has amounted to an executive coup, exactly what you're saying, Jesse, against the U.S. Constitution. Since 9-11, there has been, at first secretly but increasingly openly, a revocation of the Bill of Rights for which this country fought over 200 years ago. In particular, the Fourth and Fifth Amendments of the U.S. Constitution, which safeguard citizens from unwarranted intrusion by the government into their private lives, have virtually been suspended. The government claims it has a court warrant under FISA, but that unconstitutionally sweeping warrant is from a secret court, shielded from effective oversight, almost totally differential to executive request. As Russell Tice, a former National Security Agency analyst, put it, it is a kangaroo court with a rubber stamp. For the president then to say that there is a judicial oversight is nonsense, as is the alleged oversight function of the intelligence committees in Congress. Not for the first time, as with issues of torture, kidnapping, detention, assassination by drones and death squads, they have shown themselves to be thoroughly co-opted by the agencies they supposedly monitor. There are also black holes for information that the public needs to know. The fact that congressional leaders are briefed on this and went along with it without any open debate, hearing, staff analysis, or any real chance for effective dissent only shows how broken the system of checks and balances in this country is. Obviously, the United States is not now a police state. By the way, I would absolutely disagree with him on that. But, but given this, because they've militarized the police, and I'll get to that a little later, but given the extent of this invasion of people's privacy, we do have the full electronic and legislative infrastructure of a police state. If, for instance, there was now a war that led to a large-scale anti-war movement like the one we had against the Vietnam War, or more likely if we severed one more attack on the scale of 9-11, I fear for our democracy. These powers are extremely dangerous. There are legitimate reasons for secrecy and specifically for secrecy about communications intelligence. That's why Bradley Manning and I, both of whom had access to such intelligence with clearances higher than top secret, chose not to disclose any information that classification. And that is why Edward Snowden has committed himself to withhold publication of most of what he might have revealed. And what is not legitimate is the use of secrecy as a system to hide programs that are blatantly unconstitutional in their breadth and potential abuse. Neither the President nor Congress as a whole may by themselves revoke the Fourth Amendment. And that's why what Snowden has revealed so far was secret from the American public. In 1975, Senator Frank Church spoke of the National Security Agency in these terms, quote, I know the capacity that there, that, that is there to make tyranny total in America. And we must see it, and that this agency, meaning the CIA, and all agencies that possess this technology operate within the law and under proper supervision, so that we never cross over that abyss. That is, that, that is the abyss from which there is no return, end quote. In conclusion, the dangerous prospect of which he warned was that America's intelligence-gathering capability, which is today beyond any comparison with what existed in his the, his pre-digital era at any time could be turned around on the American public, and no American would have any privacy left. That has now happened. That is what Snowden has exposed with official secret documents. The NSA, the FBI, the CIA have, with the new digital technology, surveillance powers over our own citizens that the Stasi, the secret police in the former so-called East Germany, could scarcely have dreamed of. Snowden revealed that the so-called intelligence community has become the United Stasi of America. We have fallen into Senator Church's abyss. The questions now are whether he was right or wrong that there is no return from it, and whether that means that effective democracy will become impossible. A week ago, I would have found it hard to argue with pessimistic answers to these conclusions, but with Edward Snowden having put his life on the line to get this information out, quite possibly inspiring others with similar knowledge, conscience, and patriotism to show comparable civil courage in public, in Congress, and the executive branch, I see the unexpected possibility of a way up and out of the abyss. Pressure by an informed public on Congress to form a select committee to investigate the revelations of Snowden and others 
should be done. By the way, I disagree with that because any committee that's going to be selected is going to be already cherry-picked and biased, just like the 9-11 Commission was a fraud, just like the Warren Commission was a fraud, the RFK Commission was a fraud, and the Martin Luther King Commission was a fraud. But here's a question for you, Jesse. Tell me which media, which major media, which individual within that media, CNN, NBC, CBS, Fox News, MSNBC, which one has ever found, ever, ever, and come forward any conspiracy at all, any problems with the Warren Commission, with any of the commissions uh, for Martin Luther King, RFK, JFK, 9-11, and now any problems, major problems with the fact that we're all being spied on. The form is yours. You know, every, uh, Gary, everything you've talked about, I, I can't get, disagree. I mean, I, I guess the thing that just baffles me is why the American people continue to put up with this. Why why have they been brainwashed into thinking that somehow government will have the ability to protect them and, and not lock them up to do it? They, they, they have to understand clearly the only way government can protect you is to put you in a cell and is to take all you. And what I mean by that is, is to take your freedom. And I personally would rather take my chances and be free than to have my freedom taken and made secure. Like Ben Franklin said, those that give up their uh, liberty for security shall have and deserve neither. He's completely correct in that statement. And I'm just astounded at how the mainstream America has has accepted this role of government to be our big brother to the point where George Orwell, uh, the guy, knew exactly what was going to happen, I guess. For a number of years, Jesse, you have been one of the leading voices stating that we have fascism, we have creeping totalitarianism, yeah. we have corporate dominance, the public is not being served, we have major laws and, and state laws being passed at the behest of special interest groups who have the power, money, and resources and access to change the laws to their favor against us. We have a misinformed public and we have a distracted public. They're more interested in watching a reality television show than knowing about a FEMA camp or knowing about how their uh, all their DNA is being coded. Now we find you were right. What does it mean to you today to realize that all those stories, you were right on the button? Uh, it breaks my heart, to be quite honest with you. Uh, I wish I was wrong. You know, I, I wish that I was uh, Jesse the conspiracy theorist, theorist nutball, but I unfortunately I'm not. And uh, it makes me that much more, I mean, I, I still, I believe... I, I'm still patriotic in my own way. Uh, I believe clearly that you can love your country and not your government. Uh, for those that will dispute that with me, I would ask them to talk to German people in the 30s and see if that quote would be correct, that you, you can love your country and not your government. People need to realize that government is made up of humans and that bad people can become powerful. And uh, and ultimately, what frustrates me is we're responsible, Gary, because it's our government, and it's up to us to be vigilant citizens to ensure that we get good government. In other words, hold their feet to the fire. What what angers me today is that if you speak out, you're considered unpatriotic. When the reality of it is that you are patriotic if you speak out. These people that that whistle blow are patriotic people. They're people so moved that they will disregard their own personal safety, health, and welfare to get a truth out there that hopefully the rest of us will grab onto and right or wrong. And the, the frustrating thing is we don't always seem to want to do that as a society. And we'd better wake up and smell the coffee. Because uh, the direction we're going, it's the first time in my life, Gary, I'm 61 now. Right now, this era right here is the first time that I've been able to say in my life that I can't see better days ahead for the country. 
Let's, you uh, always have that dream that, well, tomorrow will be better. Today, I, I can't say honestly that I can say that, that tomorrow will be better. Tomorrow very likely could be worse. Let's break this into some pieces to see if we can make sense of it, and your input is absolutely essential to this. We're being told that it's necessary for them to spy on us, to collect this data. The, right, that we're all potential terrorists to them. But they're doing it for our good, and Obama said they're not listening to our phone calls. We'll show that that's a lie. This is from Adam Freedom from the Earth Island Journal, a very responsible place. Quote, we're being watched. In February 2010, mind you, that's three years ago, Tom, Janita, and a small group of residents in northeastern Pennsylvania formed a gas drilling awareness coalition, an environmental organization opposed to hydraulic fracturing in the region. The group sought to appeal to the widest possible audience and was careful about striking a moderate tone. All members were asked to sign a code of conduct in which they pledged to carry themselves with professionalism, dignity, and kindness as they worked to protect the environment and their communities. The founders acknowledged the gas drilling had become a divisive issue misrepresented by individuals on both sides and agreed to seek out the truth. The group of about 10 professionals, engineers, nurses, and teachers began meeting in the basement of a member's home. As their members grew, they moved to a local church in an effort to raise public awareness about the risks of of gas hydrofracking. They they attended township meetings, zoning and ordinance hearings, and gas drilling forums. They invited speakers from other states affected by gas drilling to talk with Pennsylvania residents. They held house party-style screenings of documentary films. Since the group had never engaged in any, any kind of illegal activity or particularly radical form of protest, it came as a shock when all the members learned that their organization had been featured in intelligence bulletins compiled by a private security firm called the Institute for Terrorism Research and Response. Equally shocking was the revelation that the Pennsylvania Department of Homeland Security had distributed those bulletins to local police chiefs, state and federal, and private intelligence agencies and security directors of the natural gas companies, as well as industry groups and PR firms. News of the surveillance broke in September 2010 when the director of the Pennsylvania Department of Homeland Security, James Powers, mistakenly sent an email to an anti-drilling activist he believed was sympathetic to the industry, warning her not to post the bulletins online. The activist, Virginia Cotty, a retired Air Force officer, got it. And uh, now here's what the memo said, quote, we want to continue providing this support to the Marcellus Shell Formation natural gas stakeholders while not feeding those groups fomenting dissent against those same companies. Now, it's a long piece, but what it goes on to say was that their groups were infiltrated, that the police got information on every single person that attended every meeting. They had, they were photographing them. They were scanning their irises. Uh, everything that they did was then put into Homeland Security. The FBI now considers everyone in any environmental protest a terrorist, Quote, more recently, according to a report in The Nation magazine, the agriculture giant Monsanto contracted with a subsidiary of Blackwater, the private security firm, to gather intelligence on and possibly infiltrate environmental groups in order to protect the company's brand name, Monsanto. Uh, This is the new normal, said Scott Crow, an author and longtime environmental activist who was the subject of FBI and corporate surveillance for close to eight years. Now, what this is showing is, Jesse... Anyone in the United States, no matter what your background, no matter what the legitimacy of your cause, no matter how peaceful you are, you are now considered a terrorist. Your phones will be listened to every call, your text messages, every single communication you have, tracking you when you drive in your car. Because your cell phone has a tracking device, your car has a tracking device, they're now keeping tabs on you if you are at all written letters of protest, signed petitions protest on any subject. It affects government or corporations. There is a corporate, private, uh, there's a corporate government relationship committees. This is just acknowledging it. It actually has put it there that we're, hey, we're on the side of the people who are gas hydrofracking. On Wall Street, every single protest in the park, every single Occupy protest in America was filmed by the FBI, Homeland Security, 
uh, identity scans were done of their eyes, background checks on every single person, well, and they even had snipers on buildings. So when I hear someone tell me, the idiots in Congress, and I consider them all idiots and sociopaths, when I hear them telling me, not a big deal, they're not listening to your phone calls, they've been listening to everyone's phone calls. And we have total proof of that, and I'll show it in a minute. Well, they've, they've been doing all this, yet, and, they, and we're supposed to believe that they're doing this for our interest? Yeah. Your thoughts, please. If I could interject, uh, well, one thing good for me, I don't have that stuff on my car, and I've never owned a cell phone. So they can't be tracking me that way. Uh, I did go to the Wall Street protests. I probably went down there about six times I, in, you know, in support. So I guess I'm being tracked, too, now, without a doubt, when you, when, when you hear that, that, uh, you know, anybody that was involved in that. And I don't know. My, my belief, again, is the fact that if we allow our Bill of Rights to be destroyed, well, then our country it goes with it. Because that's what makes us different throughout the world is the fact that we have those documents and it's the woven fabric of our country. And we have a government today that simply ignores them. And ultimately, it's in our power and we better get with it and elect people that will honor the Bill of Rights and get us back on track to what our forefathers had in mind of what this experiment in government would be. And uh, I made this statement. I said, if if a grass, I hate the money in politics. I hate the bribery. The entire system is based upon bribery. And anybody that's in it for 20 or 25 years must have a moral compass that bribery is okay. Uh, that's one reason why I usually do one term and get out, because I feel I need a shower just from being around these people for four years. And uh, But I've made the statement that if, if a grassroots started that got me ballot access in all 50 states, and that if, they, if we would rise up in some type of guarantee that I could participate in the debates, because you have to be able to debate to be a you get any shot of winning, and I don't do things like this not to win, I said I would give serious consideration to running for president, and my campaign would be on one simple message, Gary, it would be this. You as the American people would have the opportunity to make history along with me by electing our first president since George Washington, who's not owned by special interest and doesn't belong to any political party. And I really believe with that message, in a three-person race, you would have an excellent chance to win because the dynamics change when there's three people. Trust me, I know about this. And you only need 36% to win when it's three people involved. Right now, we have nearly 41% of all Americans are independent. They are, see, we only hear about the corporate Democrats and well, corporate Wait, Democrats. Gary, they claim to be independent, yet they don't vote that way. If they were truly, like when these people get elected out there, and then halfway through their term they become independents, I don't classify them an independent, even though they've seen the light. You're not an independent to me until you get elected as one. You don't get elected with the two parties and then become one after, where you use them to get elected. So these 41% of people... People that claim to be independent, I don't believe it because they still pick the lesser of two evils. They vote Democrat or Republican. They just jockey back and forth to whatever their whim has to, happens to be at the time. I agree with that. Let us. That will be for another conversation when all of us who are concerned about what has happened to our country, when we start looking for people to support who are truly independent. And keep in mind, with 41% of Americans saying they're independent, but less than 3% of Americans voting for third-party candidates who represented a true alternative, we have a lot of bridging and cooperative effort to go. By the way, Google and Facebook have both stated categorically uh, that they had nothing to, they were not aware of any of this. Uh, Mr. Chatterjee disagrees. According to him, quote, Google and Facebook discussed secret systems for U.S. to spy on users. Quote, Google and Facebook have discussed and possibly built special portals for the U.S. government to snoop on its user database, according to revelations sparked by an investigative series of articles by Glenn Greenwald. Martin Dempsey, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the top military advisor to the Pentagon in the White House, has made a series of trips to Silicon Valley in Northern California to meet with Facebook and Google and Intel and Microsoft to attempt to persuade the technology companies to help them spy on users. 
information about the program came out soon after The Guardian first published the, the series last week. Now, The Guardian followed up uh, by revealing that the NSA, National Security Agency program, uh, named PRISM that allowed the government to review contents of emails as well as audio and video conversations. And it showed that they had been working. So we've been lied to. And this is from Paul Craig Roberts. You know who Dr. Paul Craig Roberts is, right? Right. He is just, he is one of the smartest men in the country. He was the Undersecretary of Treasury in the Reagan administration, and he is right on point. Let me quote this, quote, what is the government's real agenda? Now, you mentioned, uh, Jesse, and I want you to go further after I share this with our audience, what you believe is behind it and who you believe is behind it. Quote, it has been, it has been made public information about a decade that the U.S. government secretly, illegally, and unconstitutionally spies on its citizens. Congress and the federal courts have done nothing about this extreme violation of the U.S. Constitution and statutory laws, and um, the U.S. public seems unperturbed. In 2004, a whistleblower informed the New York Times that the National Security Agency was violating the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, by ignoring the FISA court and spying on Americans without obtaining the necessary warrants. The corrupt New York Times put the interest of the U.S. government ahead of those of the American public and sat on the story for one year until George Bush was safely reelected. By the time the New York Times published the story of the illegal spying one year later, the law-breaking government had had time to mitigate the offense by ex post facto law or executive orders and explained away its law-breaking as being in the country's interest. Last year, William uh, Biney, who was in charge of the National Security Agency's Global Digital Data Gathering Program, revealed that the National Security Agency had, quote, everyone in the U.S., every citizen, under total surveillance. Every email, every Internet site visit, every phone call is captured and stored. That means the content of the uh, phone call, the conversations, not just, uh, just uh, oh, what time did you call? Nonsense. In 2012, Biney received the Callaway Award for Civic Courage, an annual award given to those who champion constitutional rights at risk of their professional and personal lives. There have been a number of whistleblowers. For example, in 2006, Mark Klein revealed that AT&T had a secret room in its San Francisco office that the National Security Agency used to collect Internet and phone call data from U.S. citizens who were under no suspicion whatsoever. The press media handled these stories in ways that protected the government's lawlessness from scrutiny and public outrage. The usual spin was that the public needs to be safe from terrorists and safety is what the government is providing. In conclusion, the latest whistleblower, Edward Snowden, has sought refuge in Hong Kong. By the way, I believe he's out of Hong Kong now. And there is no longer any doubt whatsoever that the United States government is lawless, that it regards the U.S. Constitution as a scrap of paper, that it does not believe Americans have any rights other than those that the government tolerates at any point in time, and the government has no fear of being held accountable by oh, the weak and castrated U.S. Congress, the syncopatic federal courts, a controlled media, and, and an inconsolable public. Biden and Snowden have described a precisely accurate detail the extreme danger from the government surveillance population. No one is exempt. Not the director of the CIA, the U.S. Army general, senators, representatives, not even the president himself. Anyone with access to a computer in the Internet can find interviews with these two individuals. James Clapper, the lying director of the National Intelligence Agency, who would have been perfectly at home in the Hitler and Stalin regimes, condemned Snowden as, quote, reprehensible for insisting that in democracy the public should know what the government is doing. Clapper insisted that secret, secretly spying on every ordinary citizen was essential in order to protect them. Your thoughts, please. And, and again, bottom line, Gary, they're doing it with our money. Yep. They're doing it with our tax dollars. I, and, and that right there cuts to the chase for me. I have every right to know what my government spends my taxes on. They take that money from the fruits of my labor. That's the money they use to operate and run. I have the right to know what they're using it for, and to use it to put me under surveillance is unacceptable. End of story. 
And so uh, I don't know. You know, it's kind of interesting because my my dear friends down in Mexico, my closest friends that I live around down there, they're Mexicans, and uh, they refer to me and call me Che. <laughs> <laughs> because they think I'm down there in their own way hiding out because I don't dare come up here that much because whenever I do, I cause trouble, and then I have to run down there for asylum. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we kind of we laugh about it, but uh, it's more serious than that. It, it, you know, I, I, I'm astounded over this, and I guess I, I could use it as a campaign thing. I think it's time that I become the president, so all this nonsense could end. Hopefully, well, there'd be a lot of changes if you were president. Well, th- and it'd be beyond change you could believe in, like the chapter in my book that says spare change you can believe in. Could you imagine? Just, just hypoth- hy- hypothesize for a moment. Could you imagine? If you were president, think of uh, who you could have as uh, Secretary of State. Think of uh, think of Ralph Nader. Think of the people that you could have: uh, Jill Stein and Rocky Anderson. Think of the Gary Johnson, and think of the different people that are out there who you could have as special advisors: Chris Hedges, uh, Glenn Greenwald. Think of the thousands of people that are progressives truly well populist. i already I, I i'm already familiar with it because it truly happened when i became governor i mean when when i became governor it was a hilarious situation you know we ran and we concentrated so much on winning the election that when we actually won we had no experience we didn't know what the hell to do we thought, oh, we. I remember we met in my kitchen, me and about eight of my closest people after the the day after the election, and we all looked at each other and said, "What the hell do we do now?" Because we had never, you know, we had never dethroned the Democrats or Republicans to a level of the uh, governor of the state. But what transpired was remarkable. People came out of the woodwork highly qualified, wonderful people to be part of my administration, to be part of my commission, because they saw the opportunity where it wasn't political, that they could now step forward. I had former top executives who had just retired saying, I feel it's my time to give back to the community, back to what made me what I am. And they came forward and became part of my administration. So that would be the feeling I would go forward with, is that I would get overwhelmed again with people who didn't think like when I appointed judges. I had record number of applications. I appointed 73 judges in Minnesota as governor, and that's what truly your legacy is. And in doing that, though, so many people applied because they knew it wasn't political. I can tell you this. I didn't know one judge applicant before before I ever uh, appointed them. I had a tremendous committee that came forward to me with great lawyers as a screening committee, and they would send the top three candidates to me. And I never met or knew any of the 73 judges I appointed while I was in office. And, and And the judicial community of Minnesota gives me five stars. They said he was the greatest governor on judicial appointments because they were never political. They were on qualifications. Jesse, I'm going to do something before we get back to the main theme on intelligence, our super intelligence agency. I'm going to ask you to give me yes or no answers to the following, okay? Yeah. If you were president, would you uh, close down the vast majority of military bases, of which we have nearly 1,000 around the world? Yes. Would you close down the Federal Reserve and turn over authority to print money to at zero interest to the U.S. Treasury? I'd try, but the answer would be yes. I mean, okay. remember on these yes answers, please don't hold me that I would be able to do this. I'm not saying that you could do it. <laughs> I'm mere, this but this yeah. is a fantasy. Yeah. Well, yeah. yes, because our Constitution states there's supposed to be no no central bank. Okay. So uh, I'm following well, absolutely the Constitution. There should be no central bank. Good. Would you would you hold all ex politicians and heads of any bureaucracy legally responsible for crimes against humanity they committed that could be yes, public, including presidents, vice yes. presidents? Would would you forgive all interest on student loans? I don't know. <laughs> well, think about it. <laughs> I'd have to. Th- I'd have to research that one. Okay. That one I can't give a yes/no right. because would you put, a, would, would you put a moratorium on home foreclosures? 
Uh, yes, because I, I would, uh, I would, yeah, I, I would do that because okay. of the fact that uh, I, I remember when Michael Moore told people, you know, don't get out of your homes. They don't have the paperwork. You know, they, because they've been transferred. Nobody has the original mortgage. Don't leave your home. And I've always believed in that. One thing I like about Mexico, when you turn 65 in Mexico, they cut your property taxes if you're a Mexican citizen. You get your property taxes cut in half. All right. A guy just got a few more here for yep. you that I'm curious about. Would you, would you stop all, every single penny of corporate funding corporate welfare in the United States to big agra big pharma um yeah yeah sure i'd attempt to because like i said okay. when i i never met with a lobbyist in my 4 years in office and All right. you would know you yeah su- would you support a universal health care under social security I would. I, and I don't know if whether under Social Security or not. I would have to keep uh, you know study that a little. But I would say this: I would support that every citizen in America deserves the same health care as the elected officials get. Okay, good. Those are just some of the issues. Just a few of the issues. I've got about three hundred more, but that that gets you started. <laughs> now, one of the real mysteries that many people simply cannot answer or come to grips with is who is President Obama. Really, who is he? I'm not talking about whether he comes from Kenya. That's irrelevant <clears throat> to me. What I'm caring about are <clears throat> the fact that the man tells the electorate one thing, goes into office, and does exactly the opposite, and people feel betrayed, people feel confused, they don't know how to do it, and yet the corporate Democrats has to stay, have to stay attached to him because he's their power base. Repeatedly, we are discovering that each is consistently opposite of the other, what he says, what he does. At least with Bush, when he spoke, his statements, as inarticulate and stupid as they were, uh, were so general and broad that he really meant uh, what he said. I mean, he, I can't. Well, how Jerry, would it vote I for think, him? I who who that, is he? I think that's part of the big picture that my book goes to, that it doesn't matter. What you got with George Bush was a guy who said and did things that we later found were ridiculous, and why did we do this? And he left the country in a complete mess. Well, then you got Barack Obama who came along and knew, well, they had to sell to us that, oh, we're going to fix everything now that Bush did, so this is the guy you need to elect to fix it all, when the reality was, as long as you vote for Democrats or Republicans, like I maintain in my book, you are going to get the same government. It's not going to matter because both are owned by corporate interests. If you go to both their conventions, you'll see the same lobbyists paying off both sides. Well, when you own both sides, it really doesn't matter who wins then, does it? No, it doesn't. It, there you point, go. Point, point well taken, well stated. There you go. I think that when, when, Pre, when President Obama, when you look carefully... One can only assume he lied on just about everything to get elected. His stance on the wars in the Middle East, single health care coverage, holding Wall Street accountable, the free trade acts of NAFTA, and his opposition to surveillance of American citizens, closing Guantanamo, and the list goes on. Well, Americans, maybe... American, let me just finish. Americans sure. voted for a man who they believed would be a protector of the average American in the street, and now they have a president who only protects Wall Street, the private military complex, genetically modified food giants, big pharma, the mega corporations, destroying the environment, the social fabric of a nation. So, so why do you believe that the average American still supports a two-party system? Um, because they continue to vote for it. When you look at the statistics, when Congress has an approval rating of sometimes single digit, less than 10%, and yet over 90% of all incumbents get reelected, it baffles my mind. I go, how can this be? How can the people state they dislike them to the point of a 10% approval rating, and yet they flip-flop the two numbers when it comes time to re-elect them? Over 90% get re-elected. Gary, I'd love an answer. Can you tell me? Not, not today. I can't. But but I have answers, but I'm, I'm here to hear what you have to say today. I, well, I understand. And here's what one of the reasons might be. 
One of the reasons might be re- the districts, because there's no competition out there, and it's done on purpose. The Democrats and Republicans create the districts we vote in. If it's predominantly a liberal area, that'll be a Democratic district. If it's a conservative area, that'll be a Republican district. And there's no, they never split them. There's no competition in any of the districts, and that's how come they maintain a 90, over a 90% re-election. It's all by design. You know, you're talking about two, two, two groups here that it's like, let me put it bluntly, it's like pro wrestling. In front of the public, they're adversaries. Behind the scenes, they're all working together to make money. That's what pro wrestling is. You're right. Recently, I was walking down Broadway where my office is, and there at the Beacon Theater, I saw, I looked up, and it was just starting with, was, uh, uh, was Hulk Hogan. And I went in and, and, and sat and listened to what he had to say. It was just in conversations from the audience, and, uh, and he talked about it. You know, he, and he was very honest and open about all the problems in pro wrestling and what the people see and what's really there. My, my next issue is... Well, I find that astounding from him because he was the one who whistle blew me to Vince McMahon when I tried to unionize pro wrestling. Well, maybe... I bet he didn't talk about that, did he? No, he did not talk yeah. about that. Again, he had he had his favorites there. I, I, I'm not a, a, I don't watch wrestling, but I was interested in seeing what he had to say at this point in his life. Anyhow, more important to all of us is what's happening with the media. Now, several days ago, Charles Koch of the famous Koch brothers confirmed that his company, Koch Industry, which is a $113 billion a year company, still plans to acquire newspapers. Now, one of them is your own former Star Tribune in Minnesota, or Minneapolis. Now, in an interview with the Wall Street Journal, he claims his motivation is for profits only and not to advocate his political agenda. However, given all we know about ALEC and how the Koch funds numerous organizations and media outlets like NPR and PBS and think tanks, to me it's ridiculous to believe him. Newspapers, in fact, are in financial straits due to declining readerships and by no means the kind of business anyone who has brains wants to enter for generating wealth. You don't get wealthy owning a newspaper. You lose money. Look at Rupert Murdoch's New York Post. But it's a great basis to have your ideology spread. What do you think about the idea that someone as powerful as the Koch brothers would have media all across the country? Newspapers? Well, because it's already happened. If you look back a mere couple decades ago, there were over 48, something like that, independent news media outlets that now through corporate takeover, you've got about four. So it's already happened. And it just uh, happens the Koch brothers want to buy out one of the four, it looks like, or get get involved in it. They've already taken it over. There, There isn't open media like there used to be in the old days. They're all owned. And they all answer to a corporate master. It goes right down the line. Hmm. They're just like they own the public. Look at News Corp. News Corp owns Fox News. They also own that major publishing company of books. It's all under one umbrella. And I know that because I'm involved in a federal lawsuit with it. Any particular thoughts about the trail of FBI and intelligence and accuracies and contradictions being reported about the Boston Marathon bombings? Well, I, you know, I'm, I, I was in Mexico, and I went from January till a couple weeks ago. I didn't watch any television. I did it for my own personal benefit, and it was wonderful. I learned about the Boston. Here's the thing that concerned me, not whether, the consp- whether there was a conspiracy or not. Everyone tries to get me to, oh, yes, there had to be a conspiracy because Jesse Ventura did conspiracy theory because I questioned things. But here's what troubled me about Boston. I believe if there wasn't any conspiracy involved in it, I believe the government was waiting for an incident it could have been anywhere for that uh, like that to happen so they could make a practice run of martial law. That's what I saw out of Boston was how would we implement martial law if we had to? And bo- the Boston Marathon incident worked perfect. Remember something. I worked in the Navy SEALs and underwater demolition teams. We practiced scenarios 
That's how we get good at what we do. We go over and over and over again how you set an ambush. Today it would be how you take down a terrorist installation. In my day it had switched. It was jungle warfare more. What do you do in the jungle? Right? But that's how government operates. And I viewed the Boston Marathon. I was appalled. I was shocked when I saw that the military was involved. But then again, why would I be when I tried to bring to light I, over a year ago the defense bill that Obama signed, where McCain and Levin, the Democrat, co sponsored an amendment that allows the U.S. military to now operate inside the United States? So this was an opportunity for them to move ahead with that and make we, the American people, comfortable with it. I heard when they left, they left to cheering and applause. Is that true? Yes. Well, what does, my God, this was a manhunt. Police forces conduct manhunts all the time. They were looking for one individual. And here's my question. They told everybody to remain in their homes, but they said it wasn't an order. I would have violated that immediately, and I would have walked down the middle of the street to see what would have happened. Because where in the Constitution or Bill of Rights does it say that the gut without, without – Putting martial law, which of course suspends the Constitution and Bill of Rights, without declaring martial law, where does the government have the power to tell you to remain in your home? Well, right Under right any right. circumstances, where do they have the power to do that? Who granted them that power? I have two. Uh, I they've taken the power. Exactly. Um, I have two final questions for you. Yep. One is strictly philosophical. Um, if we choose not to become proactive in defending our own freedoms, and if we believe that these large metastasized bureaucracies that want to control every aspect of our lives are the right thing to do, what does that tell, tell us about us as a, as, a, as a society, individuals excluded? That's the first thing. The second one is, is more pragmatic. And that concerns your more recent investigations uh, for your new book on the facts that prove there was a conspiracy to kill President Kennedy. And recently, there's been a small flurry of articles in the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, even talks with by Obama to completely denounce the idea of any conspiracies. And and yet we are faced with certain truths that government has conducted black flag well, operations and orchestrated conspiracies in secret against human rights and in violation of the Constitution. So there are plenty of actual prima facie examples of corporations acting immorally with malfeasance for their own personal gain while endangering the lives of others. Think of Merck and the FDA's cover up of the drug Vioxx, a serious effects that killed 66,000 Americans. Now Monsanto's lies about the safety of its genetic and modified crops. Yet to believe any of these, a person is demeaned as psychologically unfit. And what yeah, I find well, compelling is that when there are concerted efforts being made to discredit conspiracies, there's a high likelihood that a conspiracy exists that has yet to be exposed. Your thoughts, please. First, let me state this. The government always comes out with the official story. Well, that's exactly what it is. It's named correctly. It's the official story because it's generally used to protect and tell the story of the officials. Bear that in mind. Now, let's answer your questions in reverse. Uh, if I may, uh, John F. Kennedy's murder in my new book that will be out in the fall, I did this for this reason. I want it on the record for what it's worth. A hundred years from now, maybe someone will care, maybe they won't. But I did it for my own personal reason, my own per selfish reasons. I want history to know that the 38th governor of Minnesota, independent governor Jesse Ventura, does not believe the Warren Commission and does not believe, quote, my government's official story on the murder of my president, John F. Kennedy. And the only way I felt I could do that was to write a book about it. And, and, and a book, if, if when you see the title, it clearly states my position. They killed my president, or they killed our president. I don't remember which one they're going with. But uh, And so that's why I did the book on JFK, not only to bring out all the facts that I've learned in studying it for well over decades, but to, to officially go on.
on the record as a high, if I could call myself, be so bold as to say, a highly a high-ranking elected government official, being one of only 50 governors, third on the military salute list. Uh, I wanted to officially state that I do not believe it, and I wanted it to go down in history as such. I appreciate that insight. Thank you very much. Jesse, we look forward to having you back in another uh, extended conversation. The book is Very called... good, Gary, and I'll look forward to when my JFK book comes out. We'll talk an hour on it if you'd like. I'd be happy to. All the best to you on that and your new books. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. I'm Gary Knoll, and that brings us up to the end of this program, an entire hour with a person who is very much a populist. And when you look back at some of the things he's been criticized for saying, now consider what we're finding out, what we're discovering. For example, an article by um, uh, by Common Dreams, Bush era spying made legal under Obama. Security officials defend legality of government's top secret surveillance program. Well, what we were all angry about under Bush now seems to be just fine for most under Obama and they made it legal. The fact that they can make something that is immoral, unethical, legal, does not mean that we should accept it as such, and we should challenge it. And I'm glad to see the ACLU is doing exactly that. We will keep you up to date and share more. And next time around, Ralph Nader on the age of corporate treason, patriotic yardsticks for unpatriotic giant corporations. Have a nice day. Now let's go to Talk Back, 888-874-4888. If you'd like to share any thoughts, please give us a call. Your opportunity right now. In the interim, let's say hello to Luann Panessi. Hi, Luann. Hello, Gary. Boy, if people are still sitting down, there's something wrong with them. <laughs> that was quite, quite a show. Um, I have an email here from Sheila, and she is from Virginia. And she says, Dear Gary, recently a woman with a very serious illness called into your daily show, and it was her circumstances that I most related to. She said that now she is totally dependent on the assistance of friends and family, and that she felt she had little choice but to accept the help offered, even if it wasn't an ideal for her well-being. She said, I can really relate to her concerns, but in a different way. Since the economic downturn, We've experienced a sustained job loss that has exhausted all of our resources, and now we find that we, too, are soon to be dependent on the generosity of others. A relative has offered to rent us a small home and to get us on our feet, and my husband would work as a handyman in his established business. It's a beautiful area, but not sustainable to live in and very vulnerable to climate change. Having little resources at this point or opportunities, I wonder how many other people are also in the same boat that we are. They know that they'd like to live in a sustainable place, but they have no other choice but to accept the help of relatives or friends living in places they would never consciously choose on their own. Could you please share your perspective? Probably about 200 million Americans are in similar circumstances. Not all by any means are at poverty level. Not all are destitute. Not all are losing their homes but they're also facing circumstances they feel overwhelmed with. Those who would like their kids to go to college but cannot afford it. Those who have seen their standard of living substantially reduced and are not emotionally prepared to realize that you are more than the total sum of your possessions, the stuff of life. And so we have not had a concomitant psychological readjustment to our crisis. We have emoted everything. It's what we feel. It's on the sleeve. You talk with people and they tell you about what's wrong, but they don't tell you what they can do. Now, I believe that life is a series of transitions, and therefore the current transition of someone recovering from a stroke or heart attack or terminal cancer when they don't have enough strength to feed themselves is not where they're supposed to be. It's merely a step towards where they're fully competent, fully capable. It is a transition. The first day of training for a marathon, you're lucky to go a half a mile without being winded and your pulse rate up. But six months later, you're ready to do the marathon. So for these people who find themselves uh, in an an uncomfortable position, living as as couch surfers and in-laws or or, uh, friends' places, just remember that's only a transition. Also make a list of all the things you're capable of doing 
that you could have value in, that you could share in a barter or fair exchange. I, I suggested to someone that they share painting uh, to get dentistry, and it worked. They did. As it turns out, one of the people, the dentist, needed something painted. They got the painting. The person got the dentistry. They're, these are examples, and not extreme, but don't look at your current moment as the worst that things could be. When you look in a mirror, you shouldn't see who you are today. When you look in the mirror, you're merely seeing everything that you've been up till this moment. If you're overweight, you didn't get overweight today. It took years, decades. If you're depressed, it didn't happen just today. If you're broke, it didn't happen just today. So do not reflect in the mirror that that is the best you can be and that's how you should feel. In fact, if anything, wouldn't it be nice if we had a mirror that reflected forward? So therefore we could see what our efforts starting today would mean if we are consistent and disciplined. When we're not going to be overweight, we're not going to be depressed, and we're not going to be a burden to our friends or family by having to use them in a moment of emergency as a lifesaver. <clears throat> and so therefore, I see great optimism. I see communities sprouting up all over the country. When I'm traveling, I can't tell you how many assisted communities and shared communities and cooperatives and, and environmental villages I'm seeing. They're everywhere. And people from all walks of life, people that you would never expect would be there, are there. Uh, Jesse Ventura mentioned about he had all these former executives come who were retired who wanted to give something back. I see, when I'm interviewing people, I see so many people who had run major industries who are retired. No one ever calls them. They would love a chance without any need for political or economic allegiances just to do the right thing to help people. They still have for the full faculties to do so. So that's the future. So just look at this moment, this pain, from, for those who have this mindset as just part of the transition, and it will improve. All right? And, Sounds uh, good. And let's now say hello to Eutrice Lead. Hi, Eutrice. Hello, Gary. Uh, today we'll be talking about a – we'll be getting a contemporary view of Nelson Mandela's global impact, and we're – We'll be expressing shock and awe that some people are shocked and awed that the government actually wants to spy. It's in some parts of the community, it's just standard operating procedure. Think of it this way: Do you remember when the FBI had infiltrators into black radical groups, and then well, that's what we're talking about today. And how they actually how they actually <laughs> participated in causing buildings to be burnt down and bombs to be made. They weren't doing that to the uh, Bridge Club, the Daughter of the American Revolutions, were they? I don't think so. Don't think so. We'll hear what you had to say in a moment. You trace lead <laughs> in a moment. That's where I want to be 